Good morning, afternoon. Welcome. Great to have you here at Valencia. Um, Owen Blair has come a long way from uh, growing up a few hundred yards away from here on Green Bay Road. Uh, in fact, just the last week, he was appointed to the uh, National Park System Advisory Board, which is a, a very prestigious honor. And uh, I talked to Bowen before this to ask him how did he become an environmentalist and interested in the environment. And he said he had two important experiences growing up here that uh, really impacted him. And uh, one of them involved a spot many of you know, Crab Tree Farm in uh, Lake Bluff. His grandparents lived there. And uh, Bowen would go visit often. And, uh, you know, he'd see deer and geese and uh, he'd roam in the woods and just have a, a great time when he visited. And the second involved the place a little further away. Uh, Bowen went to Wyoming for many summers and he visited his godfather, Otis Carney. And uh, out in Wyoming, he saw eagles, bears, rainbow trout, and all sorts of uh, beautiful animals and fish. And he had so many wonderful memories of visiting his, uh, his godfather, who was also a novelist who wrote novels about the Old West. And he said that sort of impacted his decision too to become a writer. And he's here today to talk about his book, A Force for Nature, uh, about the Columbia Gorge. So uh, Bowen, welcome and take it away. Thank you, David, and thank you all for coming today. How's that? Can you hear me pretty well? There's another Carney connection I was reminded of when I saw Marina, and that was we lived next door to grandmother Carney, Marie and Roy Carney. And the Carneys had beautiful acres of cutting flowers. And I would go over there and chase butterflies all day long. And every afternoon, Grandmother Carney would call up and complain to my mother, but in a very diplomatic way, saying, oh, Joan, I love your son so much. Uh, I love the fact he comes over and chases butterflies, but please stop him from running all over my flowers. So I do have great memories of Lake Forest, and I really appreciate everybody coming out today. I'm just curious, a show of hands, how many of you have been to the Columbia Gorge before? But quite a few. I noticed my son didn't raise his hand, or actually I think he had, and he grew up about 15 minutes from the. So I'll start a little bit with some, um, if I can get the mouse to work. There we go with some, just to set the, uh, the gorge itself, uh, for those of you who may not know it, the gorge is one of our nation's most uh, scenic and historic landscapes. It was formed by clashing tectonic plates, the world's largest lava flows, and the world's largest floods. The floods launched thousands of years ago from around Butte, Montana, reached speeds of 60 miles an hour in the gorge, and forced one of its tributaries in the Eastern Gorge, the Deschutes, to actually flow backwards for 50 miles. They submerged Crown Point, where Vista House now stands, and the floods left dozens of creeks suspended in midair, creating one of the nation's most spectacular waterfall corridors. The gorge is one of the few places in North America where a major river cuts through a mountain range at sea level, it's 85 miles long, averaging five miles wide. It rises from river to mountains in really just a matter of yards. The Western Gorge averages 45 inches of rain and upriver the Cascades create a rainforest with annual precipitation near 100 inches. While the Eastern Gorge, a desert, averages just 10 inches of rain. So this broad range of climates produces a diverse portfolio of plants and animals. And the gorge also contains some of the nation's most historic lands, including Salilo Village, North America's oldest continuously occupied site, where native people drawn by the world's largest salmon runs. You see a theme here about the world's largest, but the world's largest salmon runs caught 100 pound fish, often four feet long. 
Lewis and Clark's Corps of Discovery spent over a month in the gorge in, 19, in 1805 and 1806. And 40 years later, it was the most dangerous part of many immigrants' Oregon Trail journeys. The gorge also hosts the Pacific Northwest's first paved highway, parts of which are now a linear park and proposed for World Heritage designation. The gorge is politically complex and includes portions of two states, six counties, two national forests, two railroads, and an interstate and state highway. It also contains two federal dams and now has 70,000 residents. It was this complexity that made, that made the gorge so difficult to protect, especially because two states were involved, one with its political and economic center, Portland, Oregon, a few miles from the western entrance, and the other, Seattle, Washington, 180 miles away. Today, I'm gonna to focus on Cape Horn in the West, just one of a dozen, dozen or more battles that Nancy Russell waged in her quarter century long fight to protect the entire gorge. As she built Friends of the Columbia Gorge and fought for federal legislation, Russell had to keep the gorgeous landscape intact, so it was worth protecting. She had to prevent the industrialization of the gorge's entrances and stop thousands of acres of scenic and historic lands, in addition to Cape Horn, from being developed. All of these battles, whether using litigation, land acquisition, or legislation, had to be fought simultaneously. Nancy Russell fought for the gorge because she connected with it physically, emotionally, and intellectually. As a young mother, she and her children had explored its trails and above all, it's wildflowers, mm. almost a thousand species of which grow in the gorge, 16 found nowhere else in the world. She put together a slideshow on the gorge's history and wildflowers for the Portland Garden Club, tracing the names of plants to the explorers and botanists they were named after, Clarkia, Lewisia, Natali, and her presentations caught the eye of a renowned architect, John Yon. In the summer of 1979, Jan invited Nancy and her husband, Bruce, to a picnic dinner at the Shire, his park-like property across from Multnomah Falls. Jan had been fighting for the gorge for 50 years, but in 1979, he was 69 years old and tiring. He wanted Nancy to join his fight. She was eager to serve, but her role was unclear. She had no experience in politics, advocacy, or fundraising but she was passionate about the gorge and knew it backwards and forwards. And she had other important qualities. Nancy had overcome adversity for much of her life. As a child of the Great Depression, her family moved 11 times in one five-year period, seeking housing that they could afford. A mother to five children, Nancy would lose a son to meningitis and later a daughter would struggle with mental illness. Tennis provided a release for Nancy and gave insight into her character. She was, according to one professional, among the best women tennis players in the nation, but unable to afford lessons as a child, she had unorthodox strokes. She made up for this liability, though, through her focus and competitive nature. She ran every ball down, never seeding a point, even in warm-ups. She sized up her opponent's weaknesses and consistently hit there, and she was always in motion, moving to net. Hit and go forward was her strategy, hit and go forward. Months after she met John Yon, the National Park Service published a 300 page report that described the gorge as nationally significant and threatened. Don Clark, Multnomah County's executive in Portland, read the study and approached Cecil Andrus, President Carter's Secretary of Interior, who was born in Hood River in the center of the gorge. Andrus promised action in Carter's second term, but Ronald Reagan won the election a few weeks later. So Clark called Oregon senior Senator Mark Hatfield. Hatfield chaired the Influential Appropriations Committee, which decides how federal funds are spent and was one of the nation's most powerful and respected senators. He was cautious, but promised if Clark built a strong diverse coalition by state, bipartisan and on both sides of the river, he would help. Clark asked his staff to find a leader for this campaign, and after some research, they also recommended Nancy Russell. In the summer of 1980, however, the outlook was bleak for federal legislation. 
The first significant effort to protect the gorge had started 70 years earlier and reoccurred and failed every generation. A national park, including much of the gorge, was proposed in 1916. An interstate park was proposed by Jan in 1935. Separate Oregon and Washington Gorge Commissions were established in the 1950s, but were advisory only, and Jan proposed a national recreation area in 1970. The decade that began in 1980 was the last chance to protect the gorge. An interstate bridge was completed in 1982, just down river from the gorge's western entrance, bringing Skamania County's century-old farms high above the Columbia and the riverfront lands between Cape Horn and Beacon Rock within a short commute of downtown Portland. All these lands were in private ownership and unzoned, except for a sliver of Clark County at the entrance to the gorge that included the thousand acre Steigerwald Lake wetlands, which were zoned, but for heavy industry. Only federal legislation could protect a two-state area as large and complex as a gorge, provide funding for public parks at the scale needed, and permanently protect the farms and ranches threatened by a suburban creek. But both governors, five out of the six gorge counties, most of the gorges, then 41,000 residents, and President Reagan all opposed legislation. And soon, Secretary of Interior James Watt would place a moratorium on the purchase of parkland. Then he proposed selling off 35 million acres of federal land. The heart of resistance to federal legislation came from Skamania County, where the bulk of the county's private land lay between the river and the Gifford Pinchot National Forest and would be most impacted by legislation. Culturally, the county was anti-government. Skamania's economy was based on logging, a dependence that caused unemployment levels of up to 30% during winters and recessions. And while there was little commercial timber in the gorge, timber companies and many of their employees resented the federal government telling them how to log. Skamania's leadership decided to fight and hired Chuck Cushman, an anti-government crusader who enjoyed his nickname, Rent a Riot. Cushman traveled the length of the gorge, conveying a stark message to thousands of residents. A national scenic area would destroy their lives. 15,000 families, virtually everyone in the gorge, he said, would be relocated. He called the National Park Service Nazis and gorge legislation the final solution. Not surprising. It was in Skamania County where two of the most destructive development proposals arose. In October 1980, a small time developer, George Reiser, bulldozed roads for his 24 lot subdivision directly across from Multnomah Falls and adjacent to Yon's Shire. State regulations required notices and hearings when a parcel was divided into five or more lots, but Reiser avoided this requirement by short platting his land a time-honored tradition in Skamania and Klickitat counties where developers divided their land into four lots, transferred the lots to friends and relatives who then divided their lots into another four lots and so on. Riser subdivision would create the largest concentration of people in the first 20 miles of the Western Gorge in Washington, all with no notice and no hearing. Cape Horn is just downriver from Riser subdivision and six miles from the gorge's entrance. Almost a square mile in size, its plateau rises 1,300 feet above the Columbia. There were no public lands on the Washington shoreline upriver to Beacon Rock, so no public trails or access to the river. In fact, the Park Service's report had revealed that Washington had only four miles of trail in the entire gorge. Nancy's vision was to create a park at Cape Horn that mirrored Crown Point across the river where Vista stood, but others had different plans. Six months after Riser created a subdivision, another developer used short flats to form Rimview Estates, a 16-lot subdivision on the Cape Horn Plateau. So one of Washington's most recognized landmarks was now subdivided with no notice and no hearing. The lots were long and narrow, running through pastures and wildflowers, to the edge of the cliff, offering spectacular views upriver to Beacon Rock. 
Nancy didn't have the resources to fight both subdivisions and promote legislation. She chose to fight Riser because that only required litigation, legislation, and the purchase of a single property. She recruited plaintiffs, hired an attorney, funded a $50,000 bond, and six months later won her lawsuit. But it was a temporary victory as all Riser had to do was to refile as a subdivision and follow minimum state regulations. Meanwhile, Grimview Estate short platted lots were selling for up to $50,000 a piece. With litigation offering only a temporary respite, Nancy contacted the trust for public land. And TPL is a national nonprofit whose mission is to place key private lands in public ownership for parks and wildlife refuges and to protect working ranches and farms with conservation easements. As a private organization, TPL can quickly secure land, unlike public agencies, which usually follow long, cumbersome processes. And unlike the Nature Conservancy, TPL does not own land long term. It options the target property, the lobbies for public funding, so a public agency can buy the land from TPL. In 1980, Nancy met the head of TPL's Western Region, Harriet Burgess, at the Shire. A former congressional staffer, Burgess knew Congress as well as Nancy knew the Gorge, and the two women soon for formed a very close bond. But with no agencies buying land in the Gorge, especially in Washington, and with no public funding, TPL would need to buy and hold land in the hope that federal legislation would pass opening it up to more risk than it ever faced before. Nancy quickly built a formidable campaign and organization. She took politicians, reporters, prospective donors into the gorge every day, regaling her targets with the gorge's importance and the increasing threats. The tours were often one-on-one, -on -one, but soon she was taking large, group, large groups, often women's or conservation organizations, on extended outings, asking them to endorse the friends legislation and write their representatives in addition to her tours nancy started the friends annual hiking weekend and before long over a thousand hikers were participating enjoying nature and listening to pitches to join the friends and write congress if prospects couldn't make it out to the gorge nancy brought the gorge to them she raised funds and helped write a compelling multimedia production who is watching that celebrated earlier protection efforts and asked who was now looking out for the gorge. Nancy would typically spend the morning and early afternoon touring the gorge with potential supporters, return to Portland by three to write letters and make phone calls, cook dinner for Bruce and their four children, and then lug 30 pounds of audiovisual equipment to an evening presentation of who was watching. Back home by 10, she would start all over again early the next morning. Nancy's work and passion for the Gorge inspired others and built crucial relationships, including one with Senator Hatfield. Their relationship formed at Steigerwald Lake, a thousand acre wetland at the Gorge's western entrance that was zoned for heavy industry. Steigerwald's landowners had just received a permit to clear cut a thousand 200 year old cottonwood trees, essential habitat for bald eagles and herons, but an obstacle to industrialization. After marathon negotiations, Burgess optioned the property, and at Nancy's request, Hatfield orchestrated an emergency appropriation of eight and a half million dollars to buy the land. Almost overnight, Washington's Western Gorge entrance went from a certain fate of factory, smokestacks, and parking lots to a national wildlife refuge, the th first of three that Nancy would help create in the Gorge. Nancy's admiration for Senator Hatfield grew as she heard him speak about his faith and philosophy. Nobody owns the land, he said. We are only stewards for future generations. And Senator Hatfield was impressed by Nancy, and at a time when conservationists were concerned about his ties to the timber industry, her vocal support was appreciated by the senator. Meanwhile, in October 1983, Skamania County unanimously approved Riser's revamped subdivision. With the friends ready to litigate again, Riser held a press conference to unexpectedly announce that TPL had acquired his property, even though no public agency or public funding yet existed for TPL to resell it. 
Just downriver, a quarter of the lots at Rimview Estates on Cape Horn had sold, and the friends received an anonymous tip that a large house was being built 50 feet from the rim. The owner was Ed Cleveland, and Ed Cleveland rarely did things in a modest way. His four acre property would soon include a two story, 6,000 square foot residence, a 4,000 square foot barn with attached apartment, a garage, several outbuildings, and a bomb shelter with five years of food. When it was finished, the house was visible for miles upriver, even at night. It nagged at Nancy as she drove the gorge each day, reminding her of what she had been unable to prevent. By 1986, thanks to Nancy's daily tours and nightly presentations, the Friends of the Gorge had grown rapidly. It had offices in Portland and Seattle and a full-time staff of four, a robust hiking weekend program with 1,500 hikers and 32 organizations participating, and a membership of almost 4,000 people. The Friends litigation was also paying dividends as it defeated Hidden Harbor, Skamania County's largest subdivision yet, approved for 83 residential lots and a marina on 78 acres downriver from Beacon Rock. All this progress, however, had put a bullseye on Nancy's back. Save the Gorge from Nancy Russell bumper stickers appeared everywhere. A widely disseminated nursery rhyme based on the house that Jack built depicted Nancy as the lady that spotted the flowers behind the house that Jack built, which led to Jack's house being condemned by a surly cigar chomping Smokey the Bear. This is a true story, the last page warned. It hasn't happened here yet, but only you can prevent a national scenic area. Other opposition was more threatening. A local sheriff for a local candidate for sheriff ran political ads warning that Nancy Russell wants us to disappear. At a congressional hearing in Stevenson, her tires were slashed and soon she would receive death threats. But Nancy just kept her focus, hit and go forward, hit and go forward. TPL, meanwhile, was on the brink of financial disaster in the gorge and needed legislation to pass quickly. By 1986, it had conveyed over $9 million of property in the public ownership thanks to Senator Hatfield. But the organization that rarely owned land still held another $4 million of property, an amount that exceeded the organization's entire annual operating budget, and it had another $6 million of land under option. Most of this land was located in Skamania County. If federal legislation failed, the trust would be forced to resell its properties for pennies on the dollar, a financial and reputational disaster. TPL's board was concerned. To address this risk and to enable TPL to buy more land, Nancy and Bruce Russell took out bank loans at substantial interest rates that they then lent to TPL at no interest. They made their first interest-free loan of $200,000 in 1984 so TPL could buy the St. Cloud Ranch just downriver from Beacon Rock. A year later, they borrowed another $200,000 to help TPL buy the first conservation easement in the gorge over a Mount Pleasant property. At Rimview Estates, meanwhile, four of the 16 lots had been sold to private parties. And two of those had been developed, including Ed Cleveland's sprawling residence. Burgess had been negotiating in vain with the subdivision owners for the 12 unsold lots until the Russells made their third no-interest loan to TPL, this time for $300,000. Using that loan, TPL was able to buy and hold the 12 lots still owned by the developer. By the summer of 1986, however, the Act, the only source of funds to allow the federal government to buy more land from TPL, seemed doomed. Private property rights organizations, timber, mining, and real estate interests mounted bitter campaigns Combative hearings came and went as Skamania residents, including at Cleveland, flew cross country to oppose the legislation. The fight attra attra attracted national publicity. The New York Times and Chicago Tribune carried extensive articles, and a scathing guest editorial in the Wall Street Journal predicted a population exodus 
in the gorge if legislation passed. Conservative Republicans in the House united to defeat a bill that they felt imposed unconstitutional federal restrictions over private property. Their delay tactic, tactic stopped the bill in both House committees as the congressional session was ending, after which the entire process would have to start over. But the session was unexpectedly extended by a week, then two, and in a remarkable turn of events, the Rules Committee, which was not supposed to meet in the session's last week, met twice to consider the gorge. At a contentious midnight meeting on the next to last day of the session, rules bypassed the deadlock committees and sent the bill to the full house, where, after four hours of vitriolic debate, it passed 290 to 91. Over in the Senate, now on the session's last full day, Senator Hatfield asked for unanimous consent to pass the House bill. Unanimous consent is a process used for uncontroversial matters, and Gorge legislation was anything but. Like their House counterparts, several senators despised the legislation, and if only one objected, the bill would die. But unwilling to confront Senator Hatfield, no one objected, and Gorge legislation passed unanimously. Proponents were ecstatic, but they knew that President Reagan had 30 days to approve the bill, or it would die of a pocket veto. President Reagan disliked almost everything the National Scenic Area Act stood for. His aversion was reinforced by formal veto recommendations from three cabinet officers representing Interior Justice and the Office of Management and Budget. Skamania County declared a week-long mourning period, flew the flag at half-staff, and used the 30 days to launch a vigorous letter writing and lobbying campaign to demand a veto. The White House was silent for 10 days, then 20. On the evening of the 29th day, President Reagan called Senator Hatfield at home to tell him that he would indeed veto the legislation. I understand Antoinette Hatfield overheard her husband tell the president, you do what you have to do. And then he said, and I'll do what I have to do. He reminded the president that his budget for the Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars to its detractors, would soon be coming before the Appropriations Committee. The next morning, just hours before the bill would die, President Reagan signed Gorge legislation into law with his right hand, according to Senator Hatfield, while holding his nose with his left. It would be the only significant new public lands bill to pass this administration. Nancy could now focus her attention on land acquisition. She had always been a bit skeptical about land use regulations, feeling that the system favored developers and believed that public ownership of land was a more permanent solution. For the first time, especially on the Washington side of the gorge, there would be significant funding to acquire land as the act authorized up to $40 million for land purchases. By the end of 1987, the Forest Service had spent over $4 million to purchase 3,000 acres in the gorge, most of it owned by TPL, including the 12 undeveloped Rimview Estate lots. TPL accelerated its buying spree, and by mid-1990s, it optioned two new properties. These lands ran for several miles from Mount Pleasant to Cape Horn, from river to rim, and had been marked 60 years earlier by John Yon for purchase. The northernmost section of these lands joined Rimview Estate's southern lots, connecting the Cape Horn Plateau to the river. Nancy successfully urged Senator Hatfield to appropriate the necessary funds, and TPL conveyed the properties to the Forest Service. By now, Nancy had inspired and guided TPL's purchase of a dozen properties around Cape Horn in green on the map, totaling 500 acres. Cape Horn also became a top priority for the Forest Service, which independently bought dozens of smaller properties, including the two remaining undeveloped lots at Rimview Estates. Of Rimview Estates' original 16 lots, 14 were now owned by the Forest Service. Only two, both of which had been developed, including the large Cleveland house, remained in private ownership. 
At this time, Nancy befriended Dan Huntington, an avid hiker and realtor, who was the first to recognize that if a handful of additional properties could be bought, the Cape Horn Plateau would support a new trail, perhaps four miles long, that would offer incomparable views upriver and end at an 80 foot high waterfall. This would by itself double the trail mileage that the National Park Service had inventoried on the entire Washington side of the gorge. Nancy soon found, however, that public ownership wasn't a sure bet. In 1995, the Forest Service considered reselling, subject to a conservation easement, Rimview Estate's southern four lots to generate revenue. Ed Cleveland, who owned the adjacent lot, would surely be the buyer, further entrenching an opponent to Nancy's proposed park. So Nancy wrote a diplomatic letter to the Forest Service explaining the history at Cape Horn and of course copied her letter to Senator Hatfield. The Forest Service soon decided not to proceed. At the same time, the Forest Service declined to buy a 10 acre parcel that adjoined Rimview Estate on the west because that property had no special resources. Nancy was a practical person, however, for my 30th birthday, she bought me an ironing board. She knew that great parks needed parking lots and restrooms, preferably placed on less valuable land. She reminded the Forest Service of her vision for a major park, and the agency reassessed and bought the land. Over the next four years, Nancy and Dan Huntington assembled, thanks to TPL, the Columbia Land Trust, and former friends co-chair Dave Kennard, a series of complicated and challenging acquisitions to complete the trail. These acquisitions included properties outside of the Forest Service management boundaries and even outside the National Scenic Area, often the only place where land was level enough to accommodate a trail. The Forest Service refused to purchase several of these properties as it rarely bought land outside its management area and never outside the National Scenic Area. But these lands were essential for the trail and eventually, wielding constant pressure, Nancy and Huntington prevailed. Another challenge faced by Nancy was that public agencies rarely bought land that was developed. Houses were expensive to tear down and raising them, even though purchased from willing landowners, played into Chuck Cushman's enduring narrative of forced depopulation. TPL didn't mind controversy, but the finances were challenging. If it bought property for a million and a half dollars and then tore down a million dollar house, it would lose a million dollars in value, plus the cost when it sold the bare property to the Forest Service. But Nancy didn't mind controversy or losing money. So in 1999, she bought one of the two improved Rimview Estate lots, tore down its house, reseeded the bare land, and sold the lot to the Forest Service three years later, losing $30,000. A year later in 2003, one of Huntington's fellow trail builders discovered that from above the waterfall at the trail's terminus, he could hike down to the Columbia River and join up with the country lane that led back to the trailhead. So instead of an eight mile out and back trail, they could create a seven mile loop. By 2004, the Forest Service TPL and the Columbia Land Trust had purchased 35 properties at or adjacent to Cape Horn, and most of the plateau's four-mile-long ridge was now publicly owned. That spring, Nancy was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a terminal illness with a life expectancy of only a few years. Over the course of those years, Nancy would progressively weaken using a cane, a walker, a wheelchair, and then a motorized chair until she was confined to bed. But she would keep working on gorge issues, particularly Cape Horn. The seven mile long Cape Horn Loop Trail was now entirely in Forest Service or nonprofit ownership, but neither Nancy nor Huntington were satisfied. While hikers could enjoy Washington's premier trail in the gorge, they had to detour several hundred yards inland from the rim for a half mile to avoid private property owned by a local family, the Collins family, and Ed Cleveland's property. With her health failing and the real estate market rising, Nancy asked Huntington to negotiate an option for her on a second Collins property. 36 acres, a modest home, two barns, and world-class views, 
for $2 million. Nancy pledged a million and friend staff soon raised the other million dollars from a Seattle businessman who had long admired Nancy. With Collins property secured, Nancy set her eyes on the last property needed to build a perfect trail, Ed Cleveland's estate to the south. Over the years, Nancy had pressed TPL to buy the Cleveland house. TPL was willing, but harbored little hope of success because Ed Cleveland had not wanted to sell. And even if he did, the cost of buying the property would be prohibitive since a large expensive house would have to be torn down and its value could not be recouped in a sale to the Forest Service. In 1996, TPL met with Cleveland, but he wanted double the property's value. In 2004, Cleveland listed his property at one and a half million dollars, but TPL's appraisers believe the fair market value was under a million dollars. Nancy, by now almost a year after her ALS diagnosis, called TPL regularly to offer encouragement and to stress the property's importance. In 2005, Cleveland rejected a $1.35 million offer from another buyer. And with this new evidence of value, TPL offered $1.4 million, but Cleveland said no. A year earlier, Nancy had created a new land trust within the Friends of the Gorge to ensure that Gorge lands would continue to be bought after her death. So now a new strategy was hatched. If TPL could option the property, it would transfer this right to the land trust, which would raise the house, replant the property, and absorb the million dollar loss in a sale to the Forest Service. So TPL offered Cleveland $1.5 million. Cleveland agreed and the property was placed under contract. Two weeks later, however, Cleveland filed for bankruptcy, almost certainly killing the deal. He had $21 million in assets that turned out, $35 million in liabilities, and over 60 creditors. The land trust attorney advised it to look for other properties. But there were no properties as important as this one. And after several months of persuasion by attorneys for TPL and the Friends, the bankruptcy judge approved the purchase. Even as her health deteriorated, Nancy spent time working on Gorge issues through 2006 and 2007. By 2008, she was using a BiPAP machine to help her breathe and had been confined to her bedroom for almost a year. One fall morning, she woke up and asked to visit the Gorge. Her nurses said it would take a few days to arrange. No, Nancy insisted. She wanted to go that afternoon. So calls were made, and just before 3 p.m., Nancy, on a gurney, was loaded into the back of an ambulance with her nurses, and they set off for the gorge, followed by her son, Aubrey, and grandson, Everett. Their first stop was Cape Horn. By now, the Friends Land Trust had torn the main house down to its foundation, and for the first time in a quarter century, Nancy had an unimpeded view upriver. To those of us who knew Nancy, it was not surprising that she convinced the ambulance drivers to carry her down a steep deer trail at the edge of the cliff where Cleveland's gazebo had stood and where her view was even better. Nancy was clearly enjoying herself. This had been the property, after all, that had demonstrated to her continual displeasure why her campaign had been needed year after year for a quarter of a century. Cleveland's house was the first one built at Rimview Estates in a legal 16-lot subdivision. Ed Cleveland had opposed the legislation and opposed Nancy's vision of a large park to mirror Crown Point. The Russell's third interest-free loan for $300,000 had allowed TPL to buy 12 of the lots and sell them to the Forest Service. Eight years later, she had to stop the Forest Service from reselling four of these lots to Cleveland for a private pasture. Her fundraising and persistence had been needed so the land trust, which she almost single-handedly had created, could buy, then raise Cleveland's house and outbuildings, sell the property to the Forest Service at a substantial loss, and ultimately put the Cape Horn, where, or Cape Horn Trail where it belonged. It had required endless pressure, endlessly applied, as National Audubon's Brock Evans was fond of saying. Nancy's ambulance continued up the gorge 
making brief stops at Beacon Rock, Major Creek, and McCall Point, visiting places that she had helped acquire either through the Trust for Public Land or on her own. TPL would end up acquiring 90 properties, close to 20,000 acres in the National Scenic Area. And Nancy and Bruce Russell would add another 30 properties, almost 1,000 acres for public enjoyment. At 9.30 that evening, the ambulance returned Nancy to her home, where 16 days later, she died at age 76. Three years later, at the site where Ed Cleveland's gazebo had stood, a large crowd gathered to dedicate a modest basalt overlook at Cape Horn. While the overlook was never formally named, guidebooks and newspapers, hikers and locals too, call it the Nancy Russell Overlook. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Yes, Rob. How did your involvement with Nancy Russell, your involvement with the Well, thanks, Rob. I, uh, I worked closely with Nancy for 25 years, and it started, I was, the Friends of the Gorge Executive Director for six years when we got the legislation passed. So my responsibility was really drafting and negotiating legislation, something I had no right to do at age 28. <laughs> but fortunately, we had a lot of help. So I, I did that, worked closely with Nancy, obviously. I, I was focused on legislation, development, litigating against the subdivisions, dealing with the media, where Nancy was building the organization, raising the profile of the Columbia Gorge. She also was very involved with the legislation, uh, but she was focused more on those things and on helping guide TPL. After the legislation passed, uh, I stayed with the Friends for another year. Then I took over Nancy's position as chairman of the board at the Friends, a volunteer position. And I started an office for the Trust for Public Land in Oregon to work on the gorge. And I stayed with TPL for 21 years. The last 15 years, I was responsible for their land acquisition nationally. I started a tribal and native lands program that worked with 70 different tribes across the country, put about a quarter of a million acres back into tribal ownership, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and, and I worked closely with Nancy at TPL too, because she not only was guiding TPL's gorge effort, but she was on the national board then of TPL. So I had a chance to work with her closely. And then I was, you know, it, it, we were a little bit apart when I was doing more national work, but then when Nancy got ALS, uh, I made an effort to spend a lot of time with her. So it was, uh, you know, it was a very close relationship. And I, and I really wanted to write the book because it, so much of this was an unknown story because and, and this is just one program within, within Nancy's Gorge work, one out of, as I said at the beginning, dozens of just unbelievably complicated, uh, absolute last minute, whether it was litigation or legislation or land acquisition, it always came down to the last second. And it almost always was successful through a variety of serendipity and other things. But it was a great story. And I worried that if I didn't tell the story, nobody else would know what happened. And so that's why, and that was my relationship. And sure. Yes. So you get in the resources to do all this. You know, Nancy has it on. Yeah, it, when, as I said it at the beginning, our, and Nancy came from very modest circumstances. She had to move, the family had to move a dozen times during a five year period when she was young. Uh, but she grew up in uh, a part of Portland that was uh, really pretty diverse. You had people who were not well off economically, and we had people who were well off. She ended up going to a great school. Uh, she wrote a scholarship proposal by herself when she was 14 years old. So that that shows you her kind of ambition and her sense. Uh, she ended up with her love of nature because her parents had built a uh, 
really primitive cabin up at Elk Lake at, I think, 9,000 feet in the Cascades. And uh, they spend the summers out there, no running water, no refrigeration, no electricity. And they were so poor, they really had to be out there. But you can only do that in summer because you get 20 feet of snow in the Cascades. A couple of other cabins were built along the lake over time. And one of them was owned by a family from Portland, the Russell family. And Bruce Russell was the man she ended up marrying. And Bruce did incredibly well at Merrill Lynch and then formed his own uh, business. So with the, the proceeds from that business, and Bruce was a wonderful person, but he was also a, a pretty traditional person. So in addition to everything Nancy was doing on the gorge, he expected dinner to be ready at six o'clock every night for their family of six. And uh, so there was that traditional element, but, but Bruce was very supportive and wanted to spend money helping protect the gorge because it was Nancy's passion. And he also had a real love of history. And as I said before, the gorge is one of the most historic landscapes in the country and of kind of scenic beauty. So that's how she ended up doing it. But they spent almost everything they had uh, on gorge protection. Yes, Pendle. It's mechanical work. Uh, botanical work. Oh, botanical. What? No, she, um, she, you're right. It was botany and wildflowers that first got her interested in the gorge. And it wasn't just the beauty, it was the history of the wildflowers, as I talked about a little bit, where she was interested in the explorers who had come out to the gorge, Lewis Clark. Uh, Thomas Nuthall, you know, a bunch of others. So she put together that slideshow slide tracing the history of the gorge and tied it all into the uh, Latin names of the wildflowers. So she was very interested in botany. That's really what got her started, but also the history. She convinced a guy called Russ Jolly, who was a close friend of hers, who was a superb botanist, to actually write a book, Wildflowers of the Columbia Gorge, that's a seminal book about wildflowers. And he credited Nancy for, he wouldn't have written it had it not been for Nancy. Yeah, sure. David. Any other questions for Moen? Uh, thank you so much. That was so informative. Thank you. Uh, just a fantastic presentation. It's great to have That's you back nice. in town. It's great and, to and do you have any books here? Or you know, unfortunately, I you know we were traveling light coming from the West Coast, so I don't. Okay. But if you're interested, you can get them on Amazon, any local bookstore. They, we sold out the first edition, oh, but they're reprinting on a as needed basis. So okay. it may take a little bit, but you can get them. Okay. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Gender oath for vote. Yeah, we have a gift for you. Gift for you. Over there. I bet. Thank you. Not very much. As I was looking around at the uh, the room, I saw these beautiful silver cups, and it reminded me that Dad and Otis Carney had won. Dad would say his first place, but I think it might have been second place in men's double that. And if Peter Carney was here, he would challenge it, saying, <laughs> saying he beat them both. Right. But I, uh, I saw those. Those are wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you both. Thank Enjoy you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Well, really, 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 so this little aisle point you may explain. So no, I'll thank you this. Well, well, thank you. And it's true that I got so much of my love for the rest and not your periodics and path. I really think the negative writer, so so. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you.
And I told people that she didn't touch my forehead off for the first three years we paid because my forehead is fine. But as a result, she built up my back there. So now she knows it's a good thing. So, 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 so much with TPL and with the friends I am on, I'm now going around the park service of my other door and I need that back to the TPL. Jack, what's wrong with what? I didn't know that. So, oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. 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 So, more like, I have to make things sound like she's talking. Yeah. I can talk. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Yeah, they never to the balls, and I actually so many so here's my background. Well, I got a group that I want to see I think of there. So, Yes, and then, yeah, yes, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it took me 10 years. Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's great to be here. So, I love to. So, let me Yeah. <laughs> And thanks for reminding me about the October days. I'm going to try to get the option to be fine. You bet. It's You want to get on for it? Yeah. Yeah. It's in this place. Be great. Thanks for seeing me. Well, thank you, Mary. I'm really appreciate it. Excuse me. Hey, that was so fascinating. Yeah, I can be more here than some genuine. Hi, how are you? I was born with born with right here. And uh, those people don't. So, you know, it's, it's an amazing story. And as I said, this is just a where one of the guys on the other great stories about. Yeah, it's, it's been one of the best places to be. It's been very uh, mild for me. Thank you. Yeah, it's good for me to go. Yeah, it's a real nice guy. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to hear. Right on your game, I'm Valley. I just want to make sure. Yeah, right now. I'm going to be a little bit of 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 a little
just put in my name. Okay. And it'll come up. Okay. That's right. Well, I really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I love to learn more about pine wood. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll see you out there. I know. Okay. Stop maybe you discuss the names on the washing. Yes. It, What's that is happening on the Oregon's? The Oregon side was better protected. There were more federal land, uh, more state parks. But we ended up to be on that like, land. Yeah. Right there, okay. And so I was just focused on Lawrence. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know when I would go out to visit Ambler, obviously they're on the Oregon side. And I would take the um, bridge over to Salmon, Washington, and I would do what's on the floor. Yes, I think it's very well. I mean, that it's like my favorite thing to do, like, walk over that. But so, like, walk when I think of Washington, you know, uh, especially with the country and everything, and well, it's being kind of more of a conservation for you, like, sure, oh, it's game. Yes, so it's like, it's sort of, and the reason you think know, uh, Washington has been progressive in most things. But we were looking, they're going to southern Washington, which is Florida, yeah. and Tiger. Yeah. Uh, Whereas, as I mentioned, you know, the gorgeous light of Portland is nice enough. So you've right, got right. a huge constituents for the amount of sea protected. Yeah. So yeah. the gorge, most of the western gorge on the Oregon says not going to the forest. Right. So that's protected. Right. Then you have strong land use laws, much stronger than Washington. Oh, really? No, it's so that protected. Amazon put a huge place for that. Yeah, but that's inside. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, they got all those menus. Yeah, in that direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. one of them, they made for her husband. Yeah. Yeah. Lives out there still with her husband, got married, and up at one of those menus. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah, it was really beautiful. But yeah, I mean, um, it's I mean, spectacular out there, but. Um, wow, I was going to ask you, like, what, what sort of the next area, like, TPL, do you all say? Yeah, I mean, it's not like... I'm not in TPL anymore, oh, okay. so I've yeah. lost kind of a little bit of that. Yeah. But, uh, oh, here we go. Like, so, so, well, yeah. so yeah. I was call, like, Grand Gammy, which is what they want to do. That's it. We'll say goodbye. And uh, stay in contact. David's going to send out an email so we get the live box and get them to everybody here. Wonderful. If you ever drive through, I feel I Now that I know you're there, are you in the phone uh, book? That's, I don't know. I haven't really seen it. Yeah, I don't. Let me give me your contact. Here, I'll write it down. It's just worked out one car I sold like 2006 and he can walk out. He can some Nice. I got tired of them talking about. Well, the spirit was plus they couldn't be. Of course. And I said, this is the other side problem right there. That's 2006. I'm 3,000. You haven't got to tell me you did. <laughs> I talked about it for three hours at 259 and it came out and it came out. Yeah, okay. You're slugging off a little bit there. It's my second time I've seen it. Uh, yeah, I signed it now. If you were signed it. We're going to have signed it for us. It's really hot. We're just... It's really hot. 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 Yes, it it's a thing. Uh, it shocked to me when I said I changed a little bit, but it's okay. Yeah. So, it's pretty, it's pretty back there. Yeah. Yeah. That's my amazing area. Anyway, so this is so great. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. yeah. everybody. You're taking that. How's that? Thanks, Rob. That's right. Yeah, I may call you soon. Thank you. Uh, Good, well, fun, well, thank you. Thanks for it. Good to see you. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
for fall, but I just like sit there and just go Oh, I teach on two and three hours, so that no straight in the media case side. Because I do hear it. Yeah, the way it's side and how you list those director areas. Well, thank you. It really good. Yeah, that was so challenging. Yeah, it's like it's gonna happen. It's it's Constant pressure pack, general structure, and the advantage. Not important to answer it, it's not even right. It's a rock running thing, which does this thing, there. Which person present a lot. What is what we can see about the certainty of the antennas? Oh, yeah, she was running some part two. Yeah, I'm not clear. But she was never had to inform it. I don't know what I'm still saying. Yeah, I'm going to take my share time down. Is that the way? Okay. Yes. Even Johnny hasn't finished with that. So uh, you got here in good company. What a what a feat! Yeah, uh, it's it's an amazing story. It was just on the end, and she was so dedicated. Was for you? you? Your mom said you were very dedicated. Working around the clock. But I, we worked pretty hard. Oh God! I mean, to fight all that. To yeah. fight that, I don't know how you. It, it was pretty amazing when you think yeah. that we had both governors, five houses, Orange County, President of the United States, yeah, and right. most of the rest of the people but, totally opposed. Yeah, now you just okay. So, but now it's saying no, young, well, well, young well, young it's under heaven. Yeah, it's yeah. it's under federal. Oh, yeah, okay. sorry, but okay. you think I got my age still there. Yeah. yeah. You know, focus on oh, it. Yeah, no so places that are so, yeah. so. all right. Yeah. And you see there in that valley? We do. Oh, do you? Yeah. When I said invited me over to see you, I'm just making a point of yeah, it. Yeah, two more dessert. Oh. Bye, bye. Bye. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, old man. Thank you, honey. And you're you well, know, let's talk. Yeah. I know. It felt really good. I got some more water. Oh, uh, I remember so. Bobo ran out when he saw that Joni was sleeping back and said, We better text me if you got a ride, so we'll know. He doesn't want to walk. Oh, well, that was a nice group. It's so nice to see Marina. He's making his jewels over. Yeah. I'm not going to go in this. What is it? Thank you. Thank you.
sẽ lên đến không No, no tienes que cerrar el programa. Pensar en la 